Although many jokes are made about the interaction between lawyers and doctors, the relationship of the law to medicine and public health is a serious and important one. On a population level, many of the greatest advances in public health have been made through laws, policies, and regulations that have protected and advanced the health of all of us. On an individual level, the law has also helped people access the services that help them have healthier lives. And these services are not just about medical care. They also include issues related to housing, domestic violence, income security, financial solvency, disability, education, and many others that directly affect the health of individuals, especially low-income individuals, who often lack the resources to successfully advocate for their rights. Today, we're going to look at some of the legal issues affecting our individual health and the health of our public. We'll also be discussing some of the services that are available to help individuals address those issues. Please stay tuned. Welcome to a Public Health Journal, a program that explores public health issues facing our society today and tomorrow. The host of the show is Dr. Ed Ellinger, Commissioner of Health for the State of Minnesota. A Public Health Journal is sponsored by the Minnesota Department of Health and the Hennepin County Human Services and Public Health Department, all working together towards the goal of healthy people living in healthy communities. Welcome to a Public Health Journal. Today we're going to look at some of the legal issues that affect the health of our community and the individuals who live here. We'll also be examining how individuals, especially those with low incomes, can get assistance in addressing those issues. In particular, we'll be focusing on the services provided by the Legal Services Advocacy Project, which is part of the Mid-Minnesota Legal Assistance Program and its local office, Legal Aid Society of Minnesota which has been providing free legal services to low-income and senior Minnesotans since 1913. Joining us in our discussion is Jessica Webster, staff attorney with the Legal Services Advocacy Projects. Since 2000, Jessica has worked in the public interest on issues related to poverty, affordable housing, public education, gender equity, HIV AIDS in South Africa, and environmental protection. Jessica is currently focused on public benefits law, including welfare and food support, hunger in schools, unemployment insurance law, and a variety of other things. Jessica, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Sounds like you know a lot about a lot of different things. Uh, no, it's like the inch the inch of depth on a mile, right? Okay. So let's, let's start. We're going to talk about some of the issues related to income insecurity and some of the resources that, that folks get. But first of all, let's kind of put it in context about what is the Legal Services Advocacy Project and how does it fit into legal aid and mid-Minnesota legal? Sure. So for folks who aren't familiar with legal aid, we provide civil legal services to families statewide. So we help people access health care, housing, uh, sometimes a family law attorney, and without fee, so it's people that can't afford an attorney. The Legal Services Advocacy Project is our research and advocacy arm, essentially, of legal aid. So we try to give a voice to all of our clients and our families at the legislature and with state agencies and county government. Okay, so you do a lot of the data collection and analysis of what's right. going on. Uh, so you don't actually provide some of the services Correct. to clients, but legal aid does. Correct. So who works at legal aid? Um, wonderful attorneys. We have uh, we have a lot of attorneys from um, we have attorneys all over the state. So people that are just starting out their career and want to make change in the world to people who have been attorneys for you know thirty years and have dedicated their career to giving equal access to justice for people who can't afford attorneys in the yeah. system. So the, so the Legal Services Advocacy Project, sort of the research arm, why, you know, as you look at it, why is legal so important, particularly in my world of public health? Why is legal issues, why are legal issues so important in public health? Sure, well, all of the issues that are important to public health, so stability in housing and hunger and nutrition and um, all of the issues regarding stability are important to public health are also important for people to, I'm sorry, for people to have assistance accessing, um, accessing that justice and accessing those programs. A lot of the programs that we help families access are difficult and complicated and sometimes take an attorney to help you access. And so that's where we sometimes come in. Okay, so what do you see in this, you're, you work in public benefits law. That's mm -hmm. one of the areas that you're particularly interested in now. Tell, what is public benefits law? So public <coughs> benefits would be things like food assistance, SNAP. Uh, some, it was formerly known as food stamps. Public benefits are unemployment insurance or our state's wealth access to cash assistance through our state's welfare program. Any kind of assistance that is 
publicly funded and that people have a right to if they are low income enough and don't have assets and need a little help. So, so those programs exist, so what role do you play in, in those programs? So these programs, um, these programs are complicated and they're difficult to access, so we're always working to help folks access these programs. We're also, we want people to know about the programs. There are a lot of folks who don't know that some of these programs exist, and so we find ways to ensure that outreach is done and that people have uh, the knowledge about the programs that they need. And, uh, you know, sometimes there are efforts to close access or limit access at the legislature or at local government level. And that's where we step up and try to give people power in the system and try to ensure that they can retain access and retain some really critical safety net mm -hmm. programs. So, so most people assume that we have a welfare system that really meets the needs of everybody in our community. Is, is that true or not? No, it's it's not true. I mean, our, when you say the word welfare, typically that means our state's welfare to work program, the Minnesota Family Investment Program, and it's meager assistance. It's $532 a month for a family of three, and that hasn't changed since 1986. Well, I think we actually have a graphic here that, that shows this, well, how it hasn't changed given the level of poverty. Explain what we're seeing here. So what you're seeing here is that 1986, the federal poverty guideline was at $725. So people at 100% of the poverty level were at $725. And our assistance level was $532, which meant people could pay the rent and they maybe had a little bit of money left over for transportation and food or a clothing, a little bit of clothing money. Where we've gotten to in 2016 is we're still at $532 a month. The cost of living has gone up dramatically. The cost of housing has skyrocketed. You can see that right here, the federal poverty guideline is at $1,680 and we still have families when we assist them temporarily, it's with $532 a month. So it's very difficult to meet your basic needs and to meet the needs of your family on $532 a month. So as, as poverty, as inflation goes up, you need more and more money to be, you know, to be out of poverty. Uh, right. But our, our welfare supports really have stayed the same, despite the fact that it's costing more to live. Right. And this is deep, deep poverty. We're not even talking about uh, you know, 100% of poverty or 50% of poverty, the kids in this program. So every everyone who's in the Minnesota Family Investment Program has children. 70% of the people in this program are children. And uh, they're living at, you know, 30% mm -hmm. of federal poverty. So who decides what the level is for MFIP grants? States. So when the Temporary Assistance to Needy Families was passed by Congress, a lot of people think of it as Bill Clinton and uh, Newt Gingrich welfare, bipartisan welfare reform. When that was handed down to states, states had a lot of latitude on how to structure these programs. And as you see, uh, Minnesota was really a leading state in helping families get stable and kind of get on a path towards self-sufficiency with a $532 a month grant, with great education and training, with food support combined and healthcare. Uh, you see a lot of people that were in MFIP kind of in that early pilot period have left and some of them have become state legislators and we have some lawyers and doctors and people who moved on and now we're at a point where the state has not invested since we received that block grant that we received back in 1996. There's been no further investment, it's block granted, it's capped and more and more money goes to administration and services and other programs in the state than to directly to families. All right. Well, I want to delve into that a little bit more and some of the other issues that you're dealing with, but first we need to take a little break. Okay. We'll be back right after this message.
Welcome back. We're talking about the legal issues that affect Minnesotans, that particularly the health of Minnesotans, with Jessica Webster from the Legal Services Advocacy Project. Jessica, we showed that, that slide earlier about you know, how poverty, the, the level of poverty has changed, but the MFIP grant has changed. Are the needs for welfare changing in our state? Are, the, are there more people needing welfare in addition to the people who are on welfare needing more uh, assistance? Absolutely. I mean, we have the, the labor market has changed so dramatically across the country and in Minnesota, and there are far more people working at really low wages. And there's a mismatch between those wages and the cost of housing and the cost of food. And we have hundreds of thousands of kids living below the poverty line and who have are living in families that even though working or cobbling together multiple jobs are not able to make ends meet. And that's where this uh, assistance can become really valu valuable for families who have just lost work, recently lost work, or not getting enough hours to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. So I know that th there's a lot of discussion about minimum wage as one way of, of pulling this up, and that would affect everybody, those on welfare or not. Uh, what are some of the other sort of income supports that are available to folks in addition to increasing the minimum wage and, and MFIT? What are some of the other things that, that actually helps financially uh, increase the stability of families financially? Food support is a big one, and obviously healthcare subsidies are a big one. And you know, when you lose a job in Minnesota, you have two places to turn for cash mm -hmm. assistance, only two. Mm -hmm. And that would be unless you go to a church or a nonprofit that can do it. But for cash support to pay your mortgage, to pay your rent, you can go to the unemployment insurance program or the welfare program. So those are the two systems, mm. distinct systems that we have. Okay, tell us a little bit about uninsurance. So unemployment insurance is, both unemployment insurance and welfare <laughs> came out of the Great Depression and were signed by FDR in 1935. And unemployment insurance was created for men who were out of work and welfare was created for moms. And so we still have these two systems in existence today. Minnesota's unemployment insurance program is nation leading. It's uh, constantly ranked as having fantastic customer service. We get benefits out in a timely way. People get a more uh, generous benefit. You get 50% of the wage that you just lost. So for a minimum wage worker, that's $732 a month. And our unemployment insurance system does help people avoid catastrophic poverty and destitution. It's a, it's a good, solid program, and it's a good model for a, a social insurance program and a safety net. Okay, so who has access to unemployment insurance? Does everybody? Theoretically, anyone who loses a job through no fault of their own has access to unemployment insurance. And so theoretically, all of us who lose a job uh, without, uh, at no fault of our own have access to that program. Where it breaks down is that this program did not contemplate today's labor market. So it didn't contemplate people who didn't have access to paid sick leave or unpaid time off, or it, didn't, it really didn't contemplate moms who had childcare responsibilities or how shift scheduling uh, changes and unpredictable schedules, how that impacts families and people with kids. And so there's an incredible churn in the low wage economy. And for a lot of reasons, there are people who quit and separate from employment that will not get through that unemployment insurance door because they're not seen as having lost a job through no fault of their own. Right. Does part-time employment have any bearing on unemployment insurance? You can access, you can access, uh, you can access unemployment insurance with part-time employment, but there are some strict rules around the amount of wages you have to have earned to right. access the program. All right, so what, I, what I'm understanding is that this program, unemployment insurance, which started back in during the Depression, was based on men working and mm -hmm. basically mm -hmm. eight to 430 jobs right. uh, on, a, on a regular basis right. um, and didn't take into account shift work or you know variable schedules and things that cause people to to not be able to maintain their job on a regular right. basis and and it also it sounds like it's it's sort of expanded as the the years have gone on in terms of its benefits have kept up with inflation it is it's indexed yeah. every year and it has been trying to modernize. I mean, there's been a modernization act at the federal level, and it is trying to recognize women in the workforce and um, how the workforce has changed and part-time work. Um, but it's not, 
it's not catching up to where we're at quite yet, mm -hmm. but it, it's, it's trying. So, so why hasn't the welfare part of this duad, you know, duality, yeah. uh, why hasn't that changed similarly? Well, I think you look at, when you look at these two systems, <laughs> when I say unemployment insurance to your audience, to you, it evokes something for people. It evokes a, a critical social insurance program it evokes something that people are entitled to, that people worked for, that they paid into. MFIP tends to evoke a handout, something that maybe people deserve or don't deserve, um, that somehow people aren't working as hard over here when they're accessing welfare. But really, what it comes down to, I believe, I would argue that it comes down to, we have we built one system for mail workers we built one system for moms. And as a country, we just haven't valued moms as much as we valued uh, out of work, you know, dads or out of work male workers, mm -hmm. white male workers in particular. So, so what is the Legal Services Advocacy Project doing about that discrepancy, that disparity, that, that unfairness? Right, I mean, it has, it's created a disparity uh, in our state where we see disproportionately middle, wa middle wage, middle income, upper middle income people tracked unemployment insurance and disproportionately very low income people and disproportionately women of color tracked to welfare. And so one of the things we're doing is just trying to highlight the disparity. I think a lot of people don't know that it exists, that we have these two systems that are now playing out very differently. And I wish as a state that we could ask the question, how do we want to treat every worker who has lost work or is out of work, not by choice. And what should we do? What does that look like? Because I feel like we do have a set of principles within unemployment insurance about stability and avoiding destitution and making it easy to access the system that we don't have in the welfare system. It's very, very difficult and onerous to mm -hmm. be in the welfare system, the paperwork, the red tape, the stigma, the It rules. is very shaming from it's the people shaming. that I've talked with. There's drug testing, there's, uh, you know, your money in unemployment insurance goes right into your bank account. Your money in the MFIT program goes onto a card that has a lot of rules and regulations about where you can and can't use it and where you can use an ATM and you can't and how you can use it. So, so what's the federal role and what's the state role in, in MFIP? So the federal government provides us a TANF, Temporary Assistance to Needy Families Block Grant to fund a majority of this program. The state matches those funds with state funds. But the federal government's very hands-off. I mean, the federal government has set out some four primary purposes for TANF. You know, they want you to avoid, um, everyone has to be a parent. They have to be below 200% of poverty. This, your program is supposed to encourage marriage and fatherhood, and that's really it. Mm -hmm. and, and so then states are left to create the program that they want to have for families. All right. Well, we've got a bunch of other issues I'd like to talk with, but first we need to take another little break. We'll be back right after this message. driving could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. Oh, you're home early. You live with your mom? That'll set your game back a few years. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Welcome back. We're talking about the legal Services Advocacy Project in Minnesota with Jessica Webster from that Legal Services Advocacy Project, part of Legal Aid of Minnesota. Uh, Jessica, you know, before we stop talking about MFIP and, and uh, unemployment insurance, who besides legal services is advocating for changing those programs or evaluating those programs or expanding and, and bolstering those programs? There are a number of government and advocacy organizations that are advocating for a strengthened MFIP or welfare program. Counties are clamoring for it. 
faith-based groups, people who represent uh, kids who are homeless, people who represent families in the healthcare arena. So there's a lot of people advocating for a strengthened welfare program and an increased benefit mm -hmm. to address family stability. Not quite as many people clamoring in the unemployment insurance context for changes to that system because I think that that system, as I said, it's a blue ribbon system. It's a great system for the people who are accessing it. So it's gonna be incumbent upon those of us who represent people who are having a hard time accessing it to really get our voices heard. Yeah, so who would be opposed? Who's, who, what's the opposition to looking at unemployment insurance? Are there some pushbacks? Well, there's uh, the way that, un these, both of these systems are funded by taxes and they're both publicly funded, tax funded programs. The unemployment insurance program is funded by a tax on employers. So as more people access unemployment insurance, there is an impact on employers. So there's not, it's not in their interest to have more people accessing unemployment insurance or to have their individual rating affected. But I think there are ways to structure it to lessen that impact on employers so it doesn't feel like that and we don't feel that tension. Okay. And in the last few minutes that we have, let's talk about some of the other programs, like SNAP, the, the food assistance program for, for food, uh, you know, food stamps. How does that work and how does that, have those changes kept up with inflation and the needs of, of low-income families? SNAP is a critically important program. It's Minnesota has done a fantastic job of helping people who are eligible access it. When I started in this work 11 years ago, you know, fewer than, less than half, per, half of the eligible people in Minnesota were accessing food assistance. And now I think we're north of, you know, 80%. And so what food assistance is, is it's a little, bit, a little bit of money each month that goes onto an EBT card or a electronic card, just like a credit card. And you go to the store and you can uh, buy groceries for your family. And it's not a lot of money. I think you may have heard of people taking the food stamp challenge and can you live on three or four dollars a day, but this money for grocery assistance for low-income families is is critical. Yeah, and what about uh, housing access, housing funds? That's because that's another huge issue, particularly from the health standpoint. Stable housing is so yeah. important for health, so important for education right. uh, and stability and, and those kinds of things. What's going on with, with it's, assistance? It, it's huge. Uh, the affordable housing needs are, are staggering. And I think that, again, Minnesota is taking a lead in a lot of ways and advocates have taken a lead in trying to build more affordable housing and to uh, invest money into the, the spectrum of needs for affordable housing. So you have families that need shelter tonight and you have families that are ready to move to uh, an apartment or an affordable home and how can, we, how can we invest and boost home ownership. And we have veterans and seniors and people with disabilities who all need housing. So there are, there's an incredible amount of need, there's an incredible amount of work, great work going on. But housing is, uh, if we could make sure that everyone accessing our state's welfare program had stable housing, we would be so far ahead. Mm -hmm. When I got into health care back in the 70s, we didn't have homeless people. I mean, and it, it came about, why, did, why do we have homeless now and didn't have homeless folks back then? Well, it's, it's complicated, but I think that, you know, we have a, a different labor market. We have a lot of folks who are homeless now um, may not be considered homeless by old definitions, right? We have folks that are living with family or living in a car or um, they're temporarily or precariously housed or their housing is not going to last. And a lot of those folks are working. So wages haven't kept pace, and but the cost of everything has gone up. So you're sort of working on a lot of these sort of income support issues and, and general these support, supportive issues for low-income families. What should our audience be concerned about? What, what can they do? What role does the general public have to advance the, the cause of some of these things? I think first and foremost, understanding that these are great investments to make early on to save down the road. So if we can ensure that children are accessing nutritious food and have stable housing, then we can start to have really great conversations about education and building the greatest workforce in Minnesota. Until we ensure that basic needs are met for kids and families, it feels, um, it feels hard to us to talk about teacher quality and technology in the classroom and things that we want to do when we're, we're here and we're not here.
So what's, what's the biggest uh, success that you've had in your, in your time working at the Legal Services Advocacy Project? Oh, I think I was very proud that we were able to ensure that low-income kids who were coming to the school lunch counter without funds were not turned away from school meals. We were able to succeed with that a few years ago, and uh, we've stopped some of the shaming and stigmatizing practices that were happening in school lunchrooms for kids that didn't have money for lunch. Yeah. And um, we're proud of that work. Yeah, well, good. Well, I really appreciate the work that you're doing because it has thank a you. huge impact on, on public you. health. So thanks, and thanks for being on the program. This thank has you. been very helpful. Thank you. I'll be back with a closing comment right after this message. The Institute of Medicine has defined public health as what we, as a society, do collectively to assure the conditions in which people can be healthy. That definition purposely leaves space for lots of people other than doctors and nurses and other health professionals. It also leaves space for issues other than medical care. It is fortunate that this definition allows for such a broad and, inclusion and inclusive interpretation of public health because it is becoming increasingly evident that is the non-medical issues that are having the biggest impact on the health of the public. Things like poverty, lack of affordable housing, food insecurity, inadequate transportation, and poor education. These are really the determinants of poor health. And if we have any hope of becoming a healthier society, it is these social determinants of health that must be addressed. All of the social determinants of health are influenced by public policies at the local, state, and national level and by people advocating for themselves and for their families and neighbors for the rights they have as members of our society. Thus, it is essential to have legal experts and legal advocates as part of the public health team if we are ever going to assure the conditions in which people can be healthy. It is crucial to have doctors and lawyers, along with many others, working together to create a society where everyone gets their basic needs met and people are given the opportunity to use their talents and their skills most productively. In other words, all of us are necessary to create a healthy and socially just society. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. I hope you can join us again next time on a Public Health Journal.